Bath, um, everyone, I'm James Bryan, uh, PhD candidate with the SDFC. Um, thanks to those who are here in person and also those who are joining me online. I think even my parents are Zooming into this, so it's a little bit exciting to be able to do this and reach uh, such a wide audience. Um, Okay. okay, so tonight I will be talking to you about my research into the beachhead operations, uh, which were conducted by Australian and American forces against uh, the Japanese in Papua in 1942 and 1943. Uh, I'll start by provi providing a bit of a general overview of what the beachhead operations were, uh, and then I'll talk more specifically about my research, my research objectives, uh, my approach, uh, and then delving into some of the results. Um, tonight, I'll, I won't be covering everything in my thesis, but I'll be specifically looking at the issues, uh, tactical and operational, that relate to learning and adaptation. So the beachhead operations occur at a pivotal point in the Pacific theater uh, late in 1942. They occur after the Japanese have uh, withdrawn over the island standards. Um, and they've pulled back to three key positions located along the North Papua coast. Buna, uh, Buna to the east, San Anandra in the centre, and Gona to the west. Now, these operations are significant for a number of reasons, uh, the foremost of which is the fact that they're the first major Allied land offensive in the southwest Pacific area, uh, and of the Pacific as a whole at this stage. They're also the first time that Australian and American forces fight together as part of co uh, a coalition. Now, there have been some minor, low-level integration during the First World War. This is the first time we see uh, the, a, co a coalition effort between the Australians and Americans at a larger level. They begin in mid-November of 1942. Um, the 7th Australian Division is tasked with capturing San Amanda and Gona. Uh, at its disposal are the depleted uh, AIF brigades, which have pushed the, the Japanese over the Owen standards. Um, and later reserves uh, of the militia are brought forward, but these have mixed levels of experience and training. Uh, on the coast, the American 32nd Infantry Division, a National Guard unit, uh, similar to the Australian militia, is tasked with capturing Boona. Now, it is a, an inexperienced force. Uh, it has only just arrived in Papua, so it hasn't had time to acclimate. Uh, and it becomes increasingly clear as the operation progresses that there are some deeper issues to do with its training and preparation. So Allied High Command feels that uh, they, they're confident of a victory at this stage. They think that the beachheads are likely defended uh, and that the Japanese are likely to withdraw. Um, so the advance is, is optimistic that a quick victory will be accomplished. I wanted to talk about the terrain of the beachheads as well, um, because this is a really salient feature in determining the character of the operations. So whilst the coastline around this area is relatively flat, it's dominated by terrain features which make fighting a military operation exceedingly difficult. There are large tidal swamps that flood rapidly with rain. Uh, there are still dense patches of jungle. Uh, those areas, as you can see on the map, that are white, um, Sorry, um, those patches that are show up light on that aerial photo uh, look like open fields, but these are in fact patches of kunai grass which are six to eight feet high. Um, furthermore, narrow beaches are fringed with coconut plantations, uh, which provide a lot of material for the Japanese to build their defences with. The climate uh, is another factor. The Allies begin this operation at the beginning of the wet season, so torrential downpours occur almost every afternoon. This rapidly floods the swamps and washes out tracks and roads in the area. The environment is hypermalarial. Um, it's estimated that at least 85% of the personnel who served there contract malaria, and that's probably a conservative estimate. And it's, a number of other tropical diseases are endemic to the area. Lastly, the few roads and tracks that were, that were there leading to the beachheads um, were insufficient for conventional military operations. And again, they washed out whenever it rained. It also meant that the Allied advance was channeled on specific axes, uh, and there was no lateral movement, or very difficult lateral movement, between the main sectors where the fighting occurred. It also meant that the Japanese could easily site their defences in a way that would have disrupt and hold up the Allied advance. 
Now, the Japanese have been constructing their defences since about September, but it doesn't seem like this has been seriously considered by Allied High Command. Um, they covered all likely approaches and were cited offensively uh, to inflict as many casualties as possible. They occupied high ground and forced the attacking forces into difficult terrain like those spots that I mentioned. There were rarely flanks to these positions because bunkers and weapon pits were all cited to be mutually supporting. And each position was a network in miniature. And as you can see from that map with the, the positions indicated in red, it would be almost impossible to advance on one position without exposing oneself to fire from another. These defences as well were sturdily constructed and exceedingly well concealed. They were exceedingly difficult for the Allied forces to knock out. So the operations break down into battles for the four distinct sections. You have the fight for Gona to the west. Uh, the operations are around the Killerton Junction on the road leading to the San Amanda in the centre. And then the Buna sector breaks down into Urbana sector, which is based around Buna village, and Warren sector, which is based on uh, the coastal strip and the advance towards Cape Endiberi and Strip Point. The Allies lack conventional fire support that would be required to attack prepared positions of this nature. Um, these weapons have been uh, given up in the hopes of uh, facilitating a quick and speedy advance and to reduce logistical requirements. Um, however, these weapons also underpin the basic tactics and principles which Allied forces fought by, uh, principle of which is the idea of combined arms warfare. So these battles are often compared to those of the First World War because of their high casualty rates, um, the difficulty in taking and holding ground, uh, and the persistent and stubborn adherence to the offensive. Um, these operations begin, as I mentioned, in mid-November of 1942. Organized resistance by the Japanese doesn't collapse until the 22nd of January 1943. So it takes two and a half, well, yeah, two and a half months almost to completely reduce these positions. I think uh, this quote by Basie really sort of captures, uh, sparked my interest in this campaign. Um, he wrote to his wife after months at the front. For weeks and weeks now, I've been trying to make bricks without straw, uh, which in itself is bad enough, but which is made much worse when others believe you have the straw. And I think it clearly captures the challenge that was facing the Allied commanders at this time. How do you dislocate and destroy a well-concealed, well-constructed network in the jungle without conventional fire support and with forces that have mixed proficiencies in tactics and leadership? It was a task that required much of Allied commanders and their forces to identify problems, to learn from their experiences, and then adapt and find solutions to these problems. Uh, and this really influenced what I wanted to achieve in my research. What I wanted to do was I wanted to challenge the conventional tactical narrative approach that typically tells the story of the beachhead operations. I wanted to look at what factors shaped the unique character of the operations. Why the Allies were able to succeed. How the Allies learned and adapted to these circumstances. And also what factors helped or hindered this adaptation. To do this, I adopted a more thematic approach. Um, the conventional tactical narratives tend to tell, as I said, the story of the beaches, focusing on the frontline soldier or the villainy of high command. They usually adopt a nationalistic or partisan method. Um, and they tend to prevent an objective assessment or analysis of the operations. What I wanted to do was change that and look at the key factors that shape the, the character of military operations. So I was looking at key themes such as doctrine and training, coalition warfare and interoperability, uh, command and control, logistics, infantry and combined arms tactics, and threaded through this a, a, a theme of learning and adaptation. And I was uh, I based this, this thematic approach on the works of, of people like Reese Crawley who used this in their analysis of the August offensive in Gallipoli. So military learning and adaptation refers to the process by which military organisations recognise problems and attempt to find solutions to them. 
And this can occur over long periods of time and is generally studied in terms of doctrinal developments. However, my interest was in operational learning and adaptation that occurred during the battle. As a starting point, uh, Nagel's five criteria for a military learning, and organ uh, military learning organization offer a useful framework for the beginning of this assessment. And he suggests five criteria are suggestions from the field promoted, do subordinates question superiors and policies, does the organization challenge its basic assumptions, do senior commanders have close contact with those on the ground, and are procedures generated locally and informally or imposed centrally and from the top down? However, again, this is more suited to addressing longer term doctrinal developments. Um, so I brought in some additional ideas from the work of <coughs> Williamson Murray, Michael Dudler, and Russell Park that addressed issues of competence and leadership, uh, of information which is critical, uh, the collection, analysis, and dissemination of this information, uh, not only about lessons, uh, but also related to how well commanders understand uh, their, fr their front and their responsibilities. And also doctrine, as this forms the basis of the principles and methods by which militaries act. So the key uh, to learning and adaptation is that ability and willingness to challenge the assumptions about one's own and enemy forces, about the terrain, and about the objectives that a uh, force is asked to achieve. What my research concluded then was that the Allied forces demonstrated a concerted effort to learn and adapt organisations, procedures and tactics during the beachhead operations. However, adaptations were not consistent nor uniform throughout all commands or sectors, nor were all adaptations successful. For the adaptation to take place though, initiative and leadership was needed to, at the lower levels to challenge these assumptions, but that the need for change also had to be recognised and endorsed at higher levels. Before moving into the specifics of the learning and adaptation that occurred, it's important just to note the command structure and the strategic context of these operations. Um, so General Douglas MacArthur, larger than life figure, is Commander in Chief of General Headquarters Southwest Pacific Area for these operations. Now, MacArthur in his headquarters performance uh, remains a really controversial aspect of these operations. Um, and these issues uh, don't occur just for the beachheads, but these are existing uh, prior to this as well. But uh, the main issues here are internal friction between senior Australian and American officers and the development of poor perceptions of combat effectiveness based on nationalistic differences. Additionally, inaccurate intelligence assessments about the Japanese strengths and intentions in Papua, plus the failure to, uh, to accurately appreciate the realities of, of combat through fundamental barriers to General Headquarters' ability to fully comprehend this operation. Most significant, though, was a persistent anxiety about the possibility of a Japanese victory in the concurrent uh, operations in the Solomons. Now, MacArthur's Chief of Intelligence had described this as a Pacific Verdun, uh, and it was clear that the Japanese and the US had made a complete commitment to these operations. And MacArthur was anxious about the potential outcome. If the Japanese won here, what was the impact for his theatre? Now this is understandable, uh, but it was handled poorly by General Headquarters, and all it did was serve to exert continual pressure on his subordinates as they were asked to quickly achieve their objectives regardless of course. Uh, the two main combat commands that were involved in these operations were the Allied Air Forces under General George C. Kenney, and then the Allied Land Forces uh, under the command of General Thomas Blamey. Now, Blamey served a dual role as General Officer Commanding New Guinea Force as well during this period. Um, what this did, though, was it placed American combat units under an Australian commander, and this, again, uh, was caused resentment among senior American officers and was another contributing factor in that antagonism between Australians and Americans that I mentioned earlier. So New Guinea Force acted primarily as an administrative command um, and it remained in Port Moresby. An advanced echelon was moved over to control the tactical elements of the beaches, and this was under the command of Lieutenant General Edmund Herrick. Now, moving forward closer to the beaches placed Herring in a better position to appreciate the realities of combat in the Pacific. 
However, the terrain of the beaches, and more generally the character of jungle warfare, served to reduce the scale of, of, of warfare and prevented formations uh, larger than the brigades from acting and forming cohesively. So what this did was it pushed responsibilities further down the chain of command for important tactical decision making. This meant that really uh, uh, between core and division levels, the major responsibilities were for uh, logistics uh, and for ensuring coordination between forces. The Australian 7th Division uh, was commanded by Major General George Basic, who I talked about a little bit earlier, and the 32nd Infantry Division was commanded by Major General Edmund Harding. Now, Harding was relieved on the 2nd of December and replaced by uh, Lieutenant General Robert Eichelberger, who was also commander of US First Corps. Um, and Harding was the victim of both General Headquarters pressure and also numerous deficiencies in the preparation and command of his force. The logist logistical adaptations proved a vital factor in the beachhead operations. And ultimately, it was the Allied ability to overcome or at least mitigate major supply issues uh, presented by the terrain and the available transport uh, and the organisational uh, procedures which uh, allowed their victory. Um, however, the Japanese defeat can in part be traced to the collapse of their supply lines. So one of the most important adaptations actually came during the preparatory phase of, of the operations when General Headquarters authorised the establishment of the Combined Operations Service Command to better coordinate logistical requirements between Australian and American forces. Now, it was significant because it served to reduce the duplication of uh, both having both Australian and American supply systems in Papua when resources were at a premium. However, it appears that this uh, decision was really at the urging of Thomas Blaney. COSC was one of the only truly integrated multinational commands that existed in the Southwest Pacific area and overcame some of that internal friction that I mentioned earlier. There was equal representation between Australian and American forces in almost all levels and all, uh, all of its functions. Importantly, it served to coordinate uh, the rear area activities such as water uh, transportation, engineering, the development of base infrastructure, the medical services and supply distribution which were vital to supporting the Allied advance against the Beaches. The other major area of adaptation was that of air transportation. Uh, air transport and air supply was a novel development during the Beachhead operations. It had little precedent and had been developing since uh, supporting the advance towards Kokoda. But it became a vital factor in the Allied logistical network after the seaborne transportation of the 32nd Division was sunk by Japanese aircraft early in the operation. The air supply was a constant process of trial and error. It needed to be uh, responsive and flexible to meet the day-to-day -day requirements of operational commanders. Airdropping could be done in an emergency, but it led to high wastage. So it was essential that airfields be established behind each of the attacking positions. Tactical commanders would forward daily requests to advanced New Guinea Forces operations staff, who prioritised supplies and then relayed these back to New Guinea Forces quartermaster staff in Fort Moresby. From here, loads had to be carefully calculated to maximise lift capacity of aircraft. This led to the development of precise loading tables for common deliveries from things like rations and ammunition, all the way up to the uh, loading tables for the delivery of sections of artillery or entire infantry battalions. Not a pound could be wasted because of the limited, uh, uh, limited number of aircraft available. However, it was a useful expedient, but last minute changes and delays were unavoidable due to the uh, unpredictable flying weather in Papua, uh, due to aircraft availability and maintenance, and also uh, due to uh, the presence of Japanese aircraft sometimes uh, appearing over the beach positions. Now, it was unsustainable ultimately in the long term, but it helped keep the Allied forces supplied while they needed it. The novel application of air power uh, also saw for the first time Australian and American combat units airlifted into the combat zone, and even the first time that artillery had been transported by air. Logistics in turn determined tactical capabilities through the provision of equipment and ammunition, and this was one of the main factors in the application of artillery fire support. 
Logistical successes, though, were ultimately tied to the Allied Air Force's ability to isolate and control the battle space. So the Allied Air Forces played a pivotal role in establishing the conditions for operational success during the beachhead operations. Early attempts to interdict Japanese shipping were hampered by ineffective tactical approaches, inexperienced air crews, and poor weather. Now, Kenny was an innovative and enthusiastic tactical air force commander who was open to experimentation and open to the suggestions of his subordinates. His bomber forces switched from using medium altitude bombing as advocated by US Army Air Force doctrine and switched to low level attacks. These proved much more effective. Slower, less maneuverable heavy bombers were also switched out in favor of more mobile, medium bombers. Now, after failing to intercept the first echelons of Japanese reinforcements and resupply, the Allied Air Forces executed a series of highly successful missions between the 26th of November and 14th of December, which completely disrupted the Japanese supply line. They'd inflicted heavy losses against Japanese shipping and dissuaded Japanese 18th Army headquarters from continuing to use surface vessels to resupply the beachheads. In conjunction with successfully isolating the battlefield through interdiction of shipping, the long-term effects of the Allied Air Forces' war against destroying Japanese aircraft on the ground paid off as the Allies were able to gradually in, uh, achieve aerial superiority over the battle space. By mid-December, the Allies controlled the air. They also controlled the sea that way. The arrival of new uh, fighters like the P-38 provided the Allies with another technological advantage. So the combination of aerial superiority and the interdiction of Japanese shipping prevented Japanese supply of the beaches and allowed the Allies to conduct operations safe from Japanese air power. This helped increase the available air and sea transport, which could be used to bring in supplies and heavy equipment like artillery and tanks which were vital to tactical breakthroughs. So the task facing the ground commanders was daunting. Destroying and dislocating a complex defensive network of mutually supporting, well-concealed and well-constructed positions without their usual complement of supporting weapons. In the early phases of the operations, attacks were mounted on a large scale usually at companies, Italian, or even regimental level. But simply put, the Allies did not possess the intelligence and the information about the Japanese positions for these attacks to be successful, and inevitably, they met with high casualties and broke down. Gradually, there was a shift to a more constant but smaller scale approach, emphasizing patrolling, infiltration, and small unit attacks on isolated positions. A US Army observer attached to Warren Force noted, our tactics were initially bad. However, they went through a rapid evolution. Our troops at first to advance in mass formations, utilizing cover with disastrous results. They changed their efforts by squad rushes or squad advances with similar results. After a week of fighting, the method finally evolved was that of a small patrol advance. In each squad or platoon, a three-man group was sent forward crawling through the grass, and the rest of the unit observing their movements closely. As soon as the three-man patrol was fired upon, the rest of the unit concentrated fire on enemy positions. So despite the improving effectiveness of these tactics and the recognition of a greater level of patrolling for information gathering purposes, the widespread adoption of similar tactics through the American forces was held back because General Harding refused to endorse it. He believed that because the American forces lacked sufficient patrolling skills to begin with, that it was not worth the time or effort developing them further. In contrast, almost immediately after assuming command, General Eichelberger began to institute a division-wide policy which emphasized those nightly patrols and infiltration tactics which had began to be proved successful. This yielded results as the American infantry in the Urbana sector gradually eroded the defences around Vernon Village. It was a slow and exhausting process, but it was a significant step in developing skills and morale. And similar approaches were adopted throughout the Australian forces as well, uh, particularly in the case of the 30th Brigade, which was a militia brigade. After sustaining very heavy losses at trying to attack the Killerton Junction on the 7th of December, uh, Porter, as commander of the 30th Brigade, 
We began to adopt a policy of stalk and consolidate, and this drew heavily on the experiences of the AIF through, during the First World War, uh, and mirrored the, the, the tactics of peaceful penetration. It gradually encroached on Japanese positions, established forward bases, and from this point, further out radiated patrols. Now, it didn't lead to any immediate tactical successes, but it was again an important step in building morale and building skills. Again, this was endorsed by a divisional commander in this case, Basie. The other component of this adaptation process was developing small unit attack tactics and drills. Now, a key step to achieving this was the recognition of the, the different elements in the Japanese defensive positions. The bunkers, the machine guns which rotated through various weapon pits, uh, the connecting trenches, protective dugouts, and the treetop snipers and observers, and how all of these different elements work together. As I mentioned, these little networks uh, are, are complete defense networks in miniature. So generally, the tactical approaches broke down attacking groups into subgroups, and each group had a specific task. The 127th Infantry Regiment developed a scheme which identified those key elements and assigned a counter-sniper group, a counter-machine gun group, and then a sweeping group to go through and thoroughly comb the area once it was secured. Again, the 30th Brigade developed a training school to teach small unit tactics and weapon handling skills. Um, and it developed a section drill uh, for attacking uh, Japanese posts. There was a specific task for a gun group, a scout group, a grenadier group, and a supporting group. Again, the importance here of small unit tactics further served to highlight the need for highly skilled junior leaders uh, with a thorough knowledge of tactics and the responsibilities throughout the subunit. However, infantry alone could not win such a battle. Combined arms fighting, drawing on a range of supporting weapons, was still required in jungle warfare. It was hoped initially that air ground support might make up for some of the deficiencies in, ally, uh, in the Allies' artillery support. However, direct air support was the lowest priority for the Allied air forces. It again prioritised establishing aerial superiority and interdicting the battlefield. It, was also meant, it also meant that Allied, uh, the pilots of the Allied Air Forces were inexperienced providing this support. The initial attacks supporting the Americans at Buna failed to hit their targets and in many cases landed on friendly troops. This made Allied forces reluctant to employ uh, air support too vigorously. It also showed that the need for a high level of information and coordination to ensure effective support. A hybrid system blending US Army Air Force and Australian uh, air support doctrines began to emerge. Uh, New, Guinea, New Guinea Force's air operations staff was greatly expanded, and a greater liaison with 5th Air Force uh, and supporting squadrons was achieved. And a system for the ground forces for requesting air support was refined. Systems using smoke, flares, and recognition panels to indicate friendly and enemy forces was also trialled but no suitable solution was found to this problem. Now, despite these developments, the problems of air ground communication and identification at the time proved insurmountable. Technologically, wireless systems were too unreliable to establish air ground communications, and too few units had these wireless sets capable of achieving such a connection. Similarly, the pilots in their fast flying aircraft a difficulty determining landmarks and the positions of enemy and friendly forces. And gradually, direct air support was phased out as more artillery became available. And whilst it proved ineffective supporting the ground forces during this stage of the beachhead operations, these experiences were important for Kenny's 1943 Tactical Air Force Doctrine. So the Allied forces attacking the beachheads uh, were supported by a fraction of the usual artillery complement that they might have known of, normally called upon. Ordinarily, an Australian division would have had 72 guns in support and an American division 48. For the majority of the operations, there were 12 25-pounders, three mountain howitzers, and a lone American 105mm gun supporting these forces. New Guinea Force controlled this arti these artillery resources so that they could simultaneously support both fronts. But the main challenge was maximising the effect of this artillery with so few guns and so, such a limited ammunition supply. One of the, 
the main impediments to artillery support, though, was the ability to observe fire and bring about accurate fires. In order to overcome these difficulties, more observers were employed than standard procedure would have had. Many were placed in treetop observation posts, uh, which were obviously dangerous places to be, or they were attached much further forward with, with infantry commands uh, during attacks. Uh, additionally, the deployment of number four Army Corporation Squadron significantly improved the ability to register rounds onto target behind enemy lines. Now, artillery was not in sufficient strength to employ barrages, so precisely coordinated uh, concentrations became the standard for fire plans. Observers worked closely with infantry commanders to work out priority targets on their fronts, and they were then attached to call in uh, additional fires on any positions which held up the attack of infantry. Fire plans had to be conducted much closer than the usual safe 200 metre zone uh, the doctrine established though. Because of the proximity of enemy forces and enemy positions. This necessitated the experimentation with charges and ranges for the artillery to achieve a suitable angle of descent, penetrate the foliage and land as shots safely. The artillery demonstrated a high degree of technical expertise and improvisation uh, to improve the accuracy of their fires, but ultimately could not overcome the fact that the 25-pounder field gun was not effective in destroying Japanese defences. Its flat trajectory and relatively light explosive charge, even with a direct hit, usually failed to destroy a bunker. A report noted that it would take a troop firing 100 rounds of ammunition to achieve the destruction of a single fortification. And this simply could not be sustained given the logistical situation and the number of guns available. The shortage of delayed action fuses, which detonated uh, shortly after shells burst in the ground, uh, buried into the ground, further impeded the effectiveness of artillery support. Notably, to bolster the weight of fire, of, of fire plans, the 32nd Division grouped its regimental heavy mortars into batteries. Now, these were commanded by artillery officers and operated like an artillery unit. This proved a very effective use of the limited fire support to achieve effects on specific targets. However, ultimately, the effectiveness of artillery fire rested on how closely infantry could follow. Many of the American units had no experience working under artillery and were reluctant to follow closely. This meant that there were the delays in the uh, in these forces reaching the enemy positions, which allowed the Japanese to reoccupy their defences and repel the attackers. In the most remarkable case of infantry artillery coordination, the 39th Battalion at Gona advanced with two minutes of their fire plane remaining, so that the troops arrived just as the final shells were exploding. Now, the fire plane made use of a small uh, supply of delayed action fuses, which reduced the risk to the attacking infantry and it permitted them to reach the Japanese defences before the Japanese had recovered. As a result of this, the, the 39th Battalion penetrated the Japanese lines, broke into the centre of Gona, and caused its collapse. However, this approach was not replicated in any other sector, indicating potentially the difficulty or the failure of the information transmission from here to the high headquarters, but also potentially as a result of the limited supply of delayed action fuses. The decision to deploy tanks of the Australian uh, 2nd 6th Armoured Regiment uh, and the experienced 18th Brigade to Boona was a decisive moment in the operations. However, infantry tank uh, tactics and understanding had to be developed on the battlefield. The tanks, lightly armoured M3 Stuarts, were poorly suited to an infantry support role, nor had their crews had any training in infantry support. These units gradually developed practical methods and procedures for planning and executing combined infantry tank operations as the battles developed. <laughs> the first attacks made on the 18th of December led to significant tactical breakthroughs, but also demonstrated some of the pertinent issues related to infantry tank cooperation. A number of tanks were damaged when they became separated from the infantry that they were supporting. They were vulnerable to individual Japanese infantry who closed on the tanks and attacked them with mines or Molotov cocktails. So this saw the creation of infantry protective parties assigned to each tank, and the photo on the your left uh, demonstrates that with the two Bren gunners assigned as bodyguards to the tank there. 
communications between tanks and infantry was also exceedingly difficult due to poor internal uh, observation from the tanks and a lack of wirelesses. Infantry developed a system of signals using or, or using flares or even simply crawling onto the back of the tanks to communicate with the crews uh, to improve that, that communication. The tanks proved highly effective, if vulnerable, in providing mobile direct fire support for the infantry. Common practice was for the infantry to indicate a target to the tank. The tank would then move up obliquely to the position, use its main gun to blast the hole in the bunker, uh, meanwhile covering the firing slits and any entrances uh, with its machine guns. And hopefully this would permit the infantry to get close enough to where they could use grenades or later uh, improvised explosives which were more effective at knocking out these bunkers. However, the application and the effectiveness of armour was ultimately dictated by the terrain. The plantations of Buna offered suitable but difficult ground to operate tanks on. In contrast, when tanks were employed at San Hernando, uh, they were confined to the main road, swamps either side, uh, and this made them easy targets for Japanese anti-tank weapons. So it's significant that these adaptations occur dynamically and organically as a product of the evolving operational experience. The battalions involved in these operations noted different lessons, but systematically, 18th Brigade's leadership implemented these changes in the different successive phases of the operations through operational orders. So it's clear that some commands proved more able to learn and adapt than others. The factors of competence and leadership, information contributed to the ability of these commands to learn and adapt. And whilst high command, uh, the levels of general headquarters and New Guinea force, uh, had limited capacity to recommend tactical adaptations, they were important to in affecting the conditions for learning and adaptation at lower levels. General headquarters demonstrated a limited ability to learn and adapt. This was primarily based on the failure to appreciate the impact of the terrain and to acknowledge the operational and tactical realities of warfare in the Pacific. For most of the campaign, General Headquarters failed to challenge its assumptions about the Japanese defences, about the Japanese strengths, and about the limitations of its own forces. The persistent and unrealistic expectations about the operations contributed to General Headquarters' interference and continuous pressure on subordinates, which was an ex uh, impediment to the measured development of solutions. This is best demonstrated by MacArthur's persistent orders to his American subordinates to attack at all costs and the warnings of imminent disasters. However, important organisational adaptations such as the establishment of cost prior to the operations was a significant factor in the ability of the Allied logistical systems to meet the requirements of the operations. Kenny's Allied Air Force demonstrated many of the traits uh, conducive to learning and adaptation. Kenny's frequent liaison with his subordinates and an eagerness to try new tactics and equipment led to a highly adaptable and effective tactical air force. It was forward thinking in the use of air power, from transportation to interdiction, and he used his successes to further challenge assumptions about what air power might achieve in the theatre. He claimed that he was constantly inventing new ways to win a war on a shoestring. Whilst air power failed in providing direct ground support uh, coordinated with ground units, its operational level effects to logistics and controlling the battlefield were important. The split between New Guinea Force as an administrative command in Fort Moresby and advanced New Guinea Force as a tactical command meant that they had different understandings of the operations. New Guinea Force uh, under Blamey was more receptive than General Headquarters, though Herring still had difficulty conveying to him the reality of the terrain and the need for tactical changes such as the 30th Brigade's adoption of the Stalk and Consolidate policy, or Eichelberger's adoption of patrols and, and infiltration tactics. Blaney could not appreciate why Basie did not try and replicate the destruction of the Japanese at Oibi Gurari through enveloping the Killerton Junction uh, positions, failing to realise that simply put, the tidal swamps prevented lateral movement within that area. Advanced New Guinea Force did not exert much tactical influence, but it did collect and disseminate emerging ideas about attacking Japanese positions that drew on the combined experience of the Allied forces and promoted coordination and understanding between the Australian and American components. 
Again, organisational adaptations proved to be significant at these higher headquarters, in particular the organisational and staff systems for air support and logistics were a direct result of learning and adaptation. Log the logistical systems employed by New Guinea Force were described by a staff officer as a triumph of improvisation. These two organisational changes were significant because air power and logistics ultimately were determining factors in the outcome of the campaign. At lower formations, commanders were important in permitting adaptations amongst subordinate commands. At the divisional level, commanders like Vasey and Eichel Berger, who were in close contact with their subordinates and regularly toured the front lines, were acutely aware of the tactical and logistical challenges facing their forces. In comparison, Harding's command headquarters was far removed from the battlefield and he had little direct personal contact with his subordinates. Harding did not have the required information to make accurate decisions or appreciate the conditions of battle. This contributed to his relief. Throughout the Australian forces, the decentralisation of command, a product of doctrine, permitted brigade and battalion commanders greater flexibility to develop approaches which suited their individual circumstances. This led to a greater variance in tactical approaches and the key lessons derived from the campaign. Learning and adaptation amongst the American formations can be delineated by the point of Harding's relief. The 32nd Division's core leadership group failed to gather sufficient information nor challenge its assumptions about the operations during the early phases. This led to a serious decline in the combat capabilities and morale of American forces. Furthermore, Harding was reluctant to change his approaches though there was evidence that his subordinates recognised this and began adapting on their own. After Eichelberger assumed command, there was a far greater effort to adapt to the conditions. This was led by an energetic and capable staff organisation and the formalisation of lessons learned into divisional policies. Captured Japanese documents noted Americans' increasing tactical proficiency. These lessons were also filtered back to Australia and influenced the training of the 41st Infantry Division. When the 163rd Regiment was finally deployed to San Anandu in January of 1943, it benefited from many of the lessons that the 32nd Division had learned at Boona, and was, as such was able to institute counter-sniper programs and small unit drills upon its arrival. So the Allied forces that demonstrated a consistent effort to learn and adapt to the myriad challenges of the beachhead operations. This was most successful at lower levels, which more readily challenged uh, their assumptions about the terrain, about the tactical and operational circumstances. This was contingent upon the competence and leadership of commanders and their subordinates, and the ability to perceive the salient issues affecting their forces. The collection of accurate and practicable information on friendly and enemy forces was key to this. Commanders who made an effort to understand the battle adapted more readily. This information then had to be collated, analysed and disseminated throughout the commands. However, this was difficult due to the administrative and communications difficulties of the operations and also the disjointed battlefield which uh, was split across multiple sectors. There doesn't appear to be much evidence of cross-organisational adaptation between uh, the Australian and the American forces. Uh, though there does seem to be, there is evidence of them sharing information, sharing intelligence and sharing lessons, but it doesn't appear that any tactical methods were directly pinched from one force or another. Doctrine and training formed the basis from which learning and adaptation occurred. Units with a greater relative training disadvantage faced a higher threshold to reach tactical proficiency, uh, and the adaptions often had to serve a training function as well. There was much that was new and unanticipated during the beachhead operations, but few of the adaptations were truly revolutionary. Allied doctrine was sound, but the difficulty was in determining how key principles and methods could be applied in jungle terrain. Experience confirmed this in the eyes of many commanders. Our adaptations were often practical uh, responses to either maximise uh, maximize the available resources or to mitigate the inherent disadvantages the attackers faced. Learning and adaptation was not consistent or uniform because of the different circumstances of each formation and unit. Whilst the, major, the first major Allied offensive operation against the Japanese in the Pacific resulted in a complete victory and the elimination of the Japanese forces in Papua, it came at a high price. 
These lessons, often as they are in warfare, were paid for in blood. The organisations, procedures and methods employed by the Allied forces at the conclusion of the beachhead operations differed greatly from those at the start. The straw, which Vasey referred to, was far less than what was conventionally available and often had to be improvised and adapted from what was on offer. At the tactical and operational level, Allied forces demonstrated a concerted effort to learn and adapt to the unique and challenging circumstances of the beachhead operation. For adaptations to take place, though, initiative and leadership was required at all levels of command to challenge the assumptions about the terrain, the task, friendly and enemy forces. Though adaptations did not always lead to immediate tactical successes, they are an essential component in the Allied victory and the development of the doctrines and practices that would see the Allies through 1943 and 1944. Thank you for your attention, everyone. I am happy to let the video run out and field any questions that anyone has.